And now, tomboy, said the squire, you are going at your own request to be chucked into this great school like a young bear with all your troubles before you, earlier than we should have sent you, perhaps. If schools are what they were in my time, you'll see a great many cruel blackguard things done and hear a deal of foul, bad talk. But never fear, you tell the truth and keep a brave and kind heart and never listen to or say anything that you wouldn't have your mother and sister hear. And you'll never feel ashamed to come home or we to see you. In India, the founding of the first public school on the lines of Rugby and Marlborough by some who had been associated with the running or setting up of these great institutions in England began on the 28th of July, 1859. It started with a prayer and a dream at a service of dedication and thanksgiving by the Metropolitan Bishop of India, Burma and Ceylon, His Lordship George Edward Lynch Cotton. Bishop Cotton was none other than the young Mr. Cotton, who is spoken of as the model young master in Thomas Hughes' Tom Brown School days. The site for the school was chosen in Jatob Simla by Bishop Cotton himself, who had reconnoitred the Western Himalayas with the objective of providing public school education for the children of European and British expatriates along lines of the established public school system prevalent in Britain. And of course, it also brought to India the prefect system. In 1864, the Jatog site was found unsuitable and the school moved to Knowleswood Spur, from where it was to grow from strength to strength. Dr. Slater from Cambridge, the school's first headmaster, nurtured the school through its first two decades with vision and dedication. He was primarily responsible for the solidity of the foundations that were to take the institution into the second century of its life. Foundations that would stand the test of time for centuries still to come. Between the 1860s and the 1960s, the school grew steadily in strength and stature. It had its ups and its downs, and it overcame. 1898, the school adopted its colors, light blue and dark blue, signifying the two universities, Oxford and Cambridge. Played in the Durand football tournament, lost by 14 goals to love. 1906, the four houses were named. 1907, the school fire, main school building gutted. 1910, Old Cotonians Association founded on the 13th of May. 1913, 50th Jubilee of the school. Old boys present the school with the Good Shepherd stained glass. 1914 to 1918, Headmaster Lewis guides the school through the dark years of the Great War to a period of steady progress. 1915, Sanaa and BCS fixtures commence. 1919, the chapel was redesigned and capacity doubled. School bakery begins. Abdul Karim and Chipu's tuck shop set up. 1925, the war memorial constructed. 1926, Hill Chief Hostel constructed, later to become Remove. 1926-1927, Amateur Dramatics Club formed. 
1929, chapel organ installed. 1930, Irwin Hall constructed. 1932, the Bishop Cotton window in the chapel was inaugurated on the 21st of August. Main school gate constructed. The Willingdon swimming bath constructed. Swimming pool dug out by schoolboys. Honor boards introduced. 1934, Ramesh Ramchandra tops in Senior Cambridge in all of India. 1935, St. Lawrence Gate constructed. School song is written and sung for the first time. We sing of days now past and gone. We sing of days to be. A song to fire the mind of youth and kindle memory. We sing of 1919 to 1935, the golden era of the school under the reign of Reverend Gillespie, 1919 to 1922, and Canon Sinker, 1927 to 1935. 1936, new gymnasium built on the second flat. 57 years later, this gymnasium was burnt to the ground. The fire is still a mystery. For many, the gymnasium was a real emotional loss. 1937, the exclusive Spartan Club formed. Membership by invitation to boys and staff who contribute exceptionally to the school games. 1938, prep school begins at Ayercliffe in Chota Simla, sold by Major Goldstein in 1964. 1939, the school choir sings at the Viceregal Palace, New Delhi. And we'll not forget that motto, Cotton's motto, you must never, never, never be overcome. The Cotton Society form goes into dormancy in 1957, revived in 1991. By the turn of the century, the school's reputation was assured. Its doors gradually opened to the upper echelons of Indian society, and it became a matter of prestige to send one son to be educated at Bishop Cotton School, Simla. Thanks largely to excellent staff, and a reasonably sound system of education, the boys enrolled in the school were beneficiaries of a fairly progressive academic program, through which they were sent up initially for the Calcutta University, then the Punjab University, and then the Cambridge Board examinations. A broad extra and co-curricular activities schedule trained the boys in the best traditions of sports and games gentlemanlike conduct and deportment and exposure to the challenges of life through outdoor and adventure training and honorable motivation. The school's growing stature also ensured that it could approach the Viceroy of the country who was deemed the first visitor and later the Governor General. The school has ever since counted among its most important well-wishers the President of the Republic, the Governor of the State, and other very important dignitaries. Lord Curzon, the first Viceroy of India, visited the school on the 17th of September 1903, and in a stirring speech made to the boys in the Holy Trinity Chapel, he said, Not a single lad who has been educated at Bishop Cotton School can go out and do nothing. When you go out into the world, do nothing without an object. Let there be an object in your heart where your emotions are supposed to be, in your mind with which you think, and in your soul where is the touchstone of right and wrong. Words that should remain engraved in the heart of every Bishop Cotton School boy. In 1947, Lord Mountbatten, India's last British Governor-General, 
address the school in the chapel. This was to lead to the custom of the presentation of the national flag by the school captain to the chaplain for safekeeping. This ceremony of presentation on the 15th of August continues to this day. With the joys of independence also came the sorrows of partition. Irwin Hall was to be witness to a moment which would be chronicled in history. The order which all dreaded came through. All the boys who hailed from the area now constituting Pakistan were forced to leave. In a moving ceremony of farewell, the then school captain, Hassan Aga, led the departing boys into Irwin Hall in single file and then led them out not among cheers of his fellow students according to old tradition but in deep and sorrowful silence while the rest of the school stood with respect an era had passed a new age was beginning in the years that passed batch after batch of old boys passed through the portals of the school going on to some of the best known colleges in India and abroad and thence on to careers of immense variety and distinction. Generals, admirals, chief ministers, members of legislative assemblies, industrialists, doctors, scientists, writers, artists, entrepreneurs, economists, social development workers and others of international repute proudly acknowledged their debt to this great school. Gradually, between the 1950s and the mid-60s, practically the entire faculty of staff left, with the exception of a few legends. The school was well into its second century, and the challenge of a new and changing India was gradually making its presence felt upon the school. This was the time when an illustrious old boy took over, Major R.K. von Goldstein, an outstanding sportsman and scholar. The period under Major Goldstein was one of some duality. He personally set great standards for others to emulate and the boys respected and admired him. Upon Major Goldstein's retirement, Brigadier S.J. Mukund of the Army Education Corps, a huge personality, took over the school. Towards the end of his 10-year period, Brigadier Mukund's health began to fail, and the years 1985 and 1986 saw much uncertainty. In November 1986, his successor, the then senior master, Ronald Narendra Hakim, was faced with the daunting task of coping with a shaken administration a weak financial condition, unfashionably low salaries and low morale. But with faith, enormous courage, the support of many of the more senior members of the staff and a new, more tightly knit and committed board of governors, Mr. and Mrs. Hakim were able to set the school firmly on the path of betterment and toward regaining its unqualified position of prestige as one of the best institutions in the continent. After 25 years of dedicated service, Mr. and Mrs. Hakim retired on the 31st of March, 1994. The reins were handed over to 38-year-old Kabir Mustafi, the senior master since 1991, an old boy of St. Paul's School, Darjeeling. Kamini Mustafi, his wife took over the junior school from Zoe Hakim. The service of installation and dedication in the Holy Trinity Chapel on the 4th of April 1994, the first of its kind conducted by the Chairman of the Board of Governors, His Lordship the Most Reverend Dr. Anand Chandulal, was an event of great distinction. Attended by the governors of the school, 
heads of institutions from all over the state, royalty and other distinguished guests, it was a fitting culmination of a quarter century of service for Mr. and Mrs. R. N. Hakim. In his valedictory speech, he quoted the words he had inscribed in the visitor's book. Headmasters will come and go, but the school will live on forever. On 25th April 1994, the Hakims bid a tearful and emotional farewell to Bishop Cotton School. The next day, the 26th of April, was a black day in the history of the school. The Hakims had a rendezvous with destiny. On their first day to a retired life, fate extinguished both lives in a car accident. Today, a cherry tree planted by the Hakim's elder son, squadron leader Anoop Hakim, Lefroy, 1975, and the headmaster in the rear garden of the lodge, stands growing steadily in memory of the departed couple. But every end marks a new beginning. The school now stands aggressively poised, capable again of competing with the best in the world, striving for excellence in deportment and pastoral care, in academics and extra and co-curricular activities. Training a child in the way he should go so that when he's old, he does not depart from it, producing men of her and commitment, moving with a vision and a sense of purpose worthy of its founder into the 21st century to serve man and country with an honest commitment that's engraved on every Catonian's heart. Overcome evil with good. And so from those who've gone before to those who are yet to come, we pass the motto loud and clear, all evil overcome. As true as is a brother's love, as close as I be grown, Throughout our lives To every wind that blows And we'll not forget that motto Cotton's motto You must never, never, never be overcome When both friends and fortune fail When wild fears and doubts assail With our motto we'll prevail and overcome